Uh, so thank you everybody for joining. Uh, the title of this webinar is Performing Ladder Surveys in Hard to Reach Areas with Complex Elevation, uh, where uh, in more detail, we'll also look at the case of Costa Rica. Uh, we'll have this webinar today in English. And by the way, tomorrow uh, at uh, six o'clock GMT plus three, we'll have another webinar on the same topic with the same panelists uh, only in uh, Spanish. So in case you prefer that one, uh, you will be able to join as well. Uh, so a bit about uh, a bit in general first about the uh, the webinar. So first, uh, I will introduce to you the ladder flight planning tools of your GCS expert. Uh, after that, uh, Maxim from Topa Drone will talk a bit about uh, their ladder systems as well as the software, and then uh, when we go on to the third part of the webinar, then Eduardo will talk a bit about. Uh, the main topic of the webinar, which is ladder flight planning in hard to reach areas of Costa Rica. Uh, the approximate duration of the webinar is one hour plus the Q&A section. Uh, I urge you to please, if you have some questions, uh, put them in the Q&A section and not the chat. You can use the chat for just, you know, maybe if there's some technical problem at some point during the webinar, you can mention that, or if you just want to send us some message, you can use the chat for that. Uh, but for all the questions, please put them in the Q&A because uh, we'll, some of them will be answered over text. We also have uh, people from our support team here, and some of them we will also try to answer live. Uh, plus, additionally, the recording of the webinar will be available after, so you'll just be able to find it on YouTube so that it will be sent to you uh, to your email. So I think then, uh, without further ado, let's get started with the webinar. So first, uh, very briefly about SPH engineering, who we are. So uh, we are active in the world of drones since 2013. We are based in Riga in uh, Latvia. Uh, we have four main business lines, which we're working with. Uh, today, we'll focus on GCS, flight planning software for drones. In addition to that, we also have GCS integrated systems, where we integrate different sensors with drones, such as ground penetrating radars, magnetometers, uh, bathymetric sensors, as well as we have the only in the world terrain following system for DJI drones. So in case you're interested in that, you can check out our website there. We also do drone show software, as well as some custom consulting and development. Uh, so as you can see here as well, we have partners all, all across the globe, as well as customers using our software in most of the countries in the world. Uh, the main industries we're working in are surveying, debt collection, as well as in the case of drone shows, entertainment. Uh, so uh, what do I do? I'll just uh, talk a bit about this briefly as well. I'm Kristaps. I'm the product owner of UGCS, flight planning software, which you can see here on the screen. I'm sure uh, many of you are already familiar with that, but in case, uh, I'm assuming there's probably some of you who are seeing this for the first time. So this is how the interface of UGCS looks like. Uh, we support most popular drones available on the market, including uh, DJI enterprise drones, so M300, M200 series, M600, as well as other drones. The full list of drones is available on our website. Uh, so the uh, software itself runs on uh, your computer, so it's going to be Mac or it can be PC, and then you connect your DJI drone either through the smart controller or through an Android app. So all the flight planning is done here in 3D. I'll also demonstrate this to you in just a moment. Um, yep, I hope this list gives you uh, somewhat of an idea of how the software looks like, at least a general overview. And so now uh, some of the points why the software is used by so many of our customers all across the world. Uh, so firstly, it's because it installs locally. There is no need to use any browser interface, nothing like that. So everything runs quite quickly. Uh, you can use this on either PC or Mac. And yeah, so it's like I said, local installation. You also have a whole 3D interface with elevation. The elevation by default, we're taking from SRTM4 elevation data and then for the maps, uh, you can actually choose what map layer do you want to use. But so here, uh, by default, we're using Google Maps. And then in addition, you can also choose Bing or some other map sources. I can talk about this later as well. And also you can ask questions about any of these points, basically. So you can also use custom map over overlays, which is actually also quite useful when you're flying in remote uh, locations. So for example, you can fly over a certain area, take pictures, stitch your own map together, 
imported into the flight planning software. And then when you'll be flying over this area the next time, or the, for example, with the LiDAR system, then you will be able to see in a lot more detail what will be located underneath the drone and if there are any obstacles or things that you should be aware of. Uh, similarly, also, you can plan your flights according to a custom digital elevation or a digital surface model. You can plan flights, of course, with terrain following. So this is one of the main features why customers are using our software. Going back here, you can actually see this is the elevation profile that is constructed of this route. And so here you can see how the terrain following works. Uh, additionally, also, you can catch maps for offline use. So when you know you'll be located in an area where there'll be no internet connectivity, then you are able to select a custom area of um, a size up to 100 square kilometers per area. And you can download that for offline use so that you know in these remote areas, you will have access to maps as well as elevation. Additional, additionally, one of the things is that our software supports not only DJI drones, but others as well, such as Artipilot and PX4. So if you have, for example, a fleet consisting of various different drones from different manufacturers, then you can use a single software to control the whole fleet. Um, additionally, you can also create routes from KML or CSV files, and the main focus of today's webinar is the LiDAR toolset. So about this, I'll now talk a bit as well. Uh, so essentially, when you're planning your flights, there's, um, as far as the altitude goes, there's two main ways how you can plan your flights. You can either plan them according to AGL or uh, above uh, ground level uh, altitude or MSL altitude. Uh, in general, with LiDAR flights, you want to be flying according to AGL altitude. And uh, this is also kind of where, like I said, GCS stands out because here you can uh, either use the default elevation source or you can actually import your own elevation source if you know that that's, this is a lot more accurate with a higher resolution. And you can fly according to that and keep a constant distance between the drone and uh, the uh, ground level. So this is one of the things for LiDAR specifically, which you can see mentioned here above, uh, for LiDAR we're using the field of view angle to calculate what should be the spacing between the side, this, between the uh, two like adjacent survey lines. So I'll also show you the software in just a moment, uh, but yeah, that's at least uh, initially so you can understand how is it all calculated. It will make more sense when uh, we look at the software. And another interesting thing that we have developed for the LiDAR toolset for flight planning is so for the turns, you can adjust the uh, turn corner radius. So you can you can see this black line here. This is sh this showing basically how the flights are normally planned. Uh, for example, with the GCS Pro license. And so these turns where you can adjust the corner radius, which is the green line, this is what you can already plan with the GCS expert. Uh, advantage of this is that you can gather data that's way more accurate because the drone will have less jerks and uh, it will fly more smoothly throughout the whole um, planned mission. Additionally, one thing we have implemented is the ability to fly these loop turns in corners. So you can define uh, what should be the angle between two lines that come together at which the software should add a loop turn. For the loop turn as well, you can define what should be the uh, corner radius. You can define also what should be the length uh, the, or the basically the straight flight after the drone does the turn. And so using this, you can also gather more accurate data and you can ensure that uh, actually the IMU of the ladder sensor will be additionally calibrated using like using these turns. So about the GCS Expert license, uh, what are the main features of that and why should you look into that for LiDAR flights? Uh, so first, it comes with two important flight planning tools. First one is the LiDAR area, and the second one is the LiDAR corridor. Both of these are, are planned according to the field of view angle, and both of these also come with the options that I mentioned in the slide before. So you can adjust the turn radius, and you can also use loop turns. Additionally, we also support uh, calibration actions. So you can either add them in the route itself. So you can, for example, add the figure eight calibration pattern before the ladder area. You can add it after as well. And then additionally, as an action, uh, and this I'll show in just a moment, you can add either figure eight or U-shape uh, J-hook uh, calibration patterns as well. And so, yeah, with UGCS Expert, you can just go to our shop, so shopugcs.com, and you can read all about it uh, and see whether it is for you. And by the way, we also have a free 14-day uh, trial that you can apply for. 
So what I mentioned about the pattern uh, tool is that here uh, in the software, I'll, I won't be able to show this on the demo because for that I need to have a real drone connected. But basically you have this pattern button and after pressing this, you can then choose if you want to use the figure eight or the U-shape pattern. And then after you, after you have chosen it, you can simply place it here on the map and then the drone will fly the calibration. So this is useful. Uh, if you, let's say, compare it to the IMU calibration action that you can add in the route itself. So this one's useful, let's say, when you fly a larger route and then, uh, for example, you do the first calibration that's already in the route at the beginning. And then when you need to restart flying the route, then this is important because as soon as you take off, you can do the uh, calibration using the pattern action. And then you can send the drone to continue the route from where it left off. And so here as well, in the screenshots, you can see a couple of other things. So in the screenshot above, you can see the adjustable uh, corner turn radius, as well as this is the IMU calibration pattern. And then in the screenshot below, you can actually also see the uh, loop turns. But I think uh, it will make more sense when I show you the software itself. So I think maybe let's uh, jump on over to that. So I'll just stop this uh, screen share and then let's just go to UGCS screen. So just give me a second here. And by the way, while I'm showing all of this, you can uh, think about like maybe what questions do you have and what would you like me to answer uh, at the end of my part? But basically here now I'll demonstrate the software itself. And after the software demo, we will move on to Maxim's part where he will talk about LiDAR sensors. So I uh, hope you should be able to see the uh, screen. So uh, Maxim, can you, can you also see the uh, GCS screen? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, perfect. Just yeah. checking. Okay. All right. So, like I mentioned before, you can basically plan your flights in a 3D environment. So, you can kind of see how it all looks like. And now let's just zoom into some location where we can plan our flights. So, let's, for example, go somewhere over here. Just move these zoom controls a bit out of the way. So, in general, in GCS screen, everything is kind of divided into two parts. So everything that's here on the uh, right side of the screen is concerning your drone control. So up here, you can see the drone that's currently connected. This is just an emulator drone, but this should be enough for the demo. And then everything that's here on the uh, left side, this is concerning your route planning. So I think now maybe let's get started with uh, planning the flights. I'll make the screen just a bit larger for me and i hope that uh you can still see it if, if there's some problem just let me know but uh i hope that this should be okay i'll just move move some uh, zoom windows around here and i think we should now be good to go so now you can see here on the left side i have already one route created uh and then i think for this route we can already start actually planning the flight so let's start with the lidar area so for the lidar area you can select the lidar area tool over here and then holding down the shift button, you can press and add points here on the map. Once you're done with that, you can press on enter to complete that. And then you can also adjust the direction angle using this arrow here. Now let's see if uh, it might exceed the fence radius. Yeah, let's, uh, the default fence radius is about 500 meters. So let's just decrease this. And you can also, if you want, you can change the fence radius in the profile. But now to maybe simplify things a bit, I'll just make the route a bit smaller. And I hope that now, yeah, so now this should be okay. So you can see now the software has already calculated and constructed our route. You can see that the route will start from here, I think. Yeah, so this you can see is waypoint number one, and it will, of course, go on until there. Uh, now, after this, I think let's maybe add already a uh, IMU calibration action. So we can go over here to pattern. And then, for example, after LiDAR area, we can shift click and then again add the pattern action. So let's add it, for example, somewhere over here. I think this should be good. If you want, you can also move it around, basically add it to where you want. And let's actually add another one, but the other one we will add here at the beginning and then also we'll move it to the beginning of the route. So let's just go here. I'll add another pattern action over here. And then 
basically here you can see this is the order of the segments in the root. So there's this pattern tool I can take and move like so to the very uh, beginning. So you can now see we have a simple mission constructed consisting of three segments. So we have the pattern calibration, uh, then we have our ladder area, and then after that we have another uh, calibration pattern that the drone will fly. Now let's just briefly let's take a look at this ladder area and let's see what parameters are here and what should we adjust additionally. So one of the first parameters you can see here, this is the field of view angle. So the angle basically is different for each sensor. And in this case, let's maybe use an angle of something like 70 degrees, which is a bit more popular, I suppose, among sensors. Now, next, the altitude mode, you can see it's currently set to AGL. And I think let's for now keep this as AGL because in most cases, you do want your drone to follow the terrain as it's flying. Uh, the flight height, let's change this. The typical flight height for ladder surveys can be somewhere around uh, 50 meters. So let's change this to 50. And then next, you can see uh, the uh, uh, line spacing. So line spacing basically is, you can set this either according to a certain side overlap, which in this case is set as 30%, or you can also use a specified side distance. In this case, I'll just use the overlap. Then additionally, you can see that here, uh, the survey seems to kind of cut off a bit short here. So I'll just take this corner, move it around. And so you can do these manipulations with, uh, at least in case when you need to expand it a bit, then you can do that. And so now I want to show what I was showing there in the presentation. So how can you adjust the uh, corner radius and how can you make uh, the drone do the loop turns if you need to? So now to uh, change the corner radius, you can just go here. So this is the corner radius parameter. By default, it's set to six meters. And if you need to change that, you can simply select it and then enter a larger value. Oh, sorry, somehow selected all of it. Let's just go back here, yeah. So now instead of six, we can enter something like, let's say 20 meters as the corner radius. And so now you should see that once the route is calculated, you can see that the corners are now a lot more smooth than in the previous version of this route that we had. And then additionally, in cases when you want the drone to do a loop turn, you can also do this by changing the loop turn angle. So for example, if we set the loop turn angle, let's try 90 degrees first. It might do the loop turns now on some of the turns. Yeah, so now I can see here in cases where the angle between those two lines is uh, larger, then the drone will do the uh, loop turn in those cases. Additionally, also you have two types of turn types. In GCS, we have adaptive bank turn and we have stop and turn, but with LiDAR tools, of course, you want the drone to do the adaptive bank turn so that it can fly through uh, the corners with a specified corner radius and also perform the loop turns. What also mentioned with the loop turns is that you can actually change the uh, length of the straight flight after turn. So you can see currently this is set to 10 and you can also, for example, increase this if you need to. So this is how you can construct a simple area scan mission for LiDAR. Uh, of course, if you want to fly a larger area, then you will need to increase the fence radius. So I'll just show how you can do this as well. And then we can easily now expand the area. So let's just go to profiles. Uh, this route should be constructed for M300, I believe. And then here we can go and then change what's the fence radius. So, and I think that now we should be able to increase the size of this route even more. Yeah, well, and you can see how it looks like now. Uh, I'll just move this corner outwards a bit as well. Yeah, so this is looking already quite good. And then next we can go here into parameters because I'm very interested now in seeing what will be the uh, height of the flight with respect to the elevation. Plus additionally, what I'm interested in is the total length of the route. So you can go here into a route parameters and then show elevation. And so we are now presented with the elevation window. So what information can you see here? You can see firstly, the total distance the drone will cover total estimated duration. So for example, you can see that for this flight, the drone will take about 23 minutes to fly through it. You can see the total amount of waypoints as well as the minimum and maximum MSL and AGL altitudes. So this is 
these are kind of the basics of how do you plan an area scan route in UGCS. And uh, I'll just very briefly show the corridor scan tool as well. And I think that then we will be able to already move on to the next section uh, of this webinar. But keep in mind, like all questions that you have, uh, I will be able to answer them in the Q&A. So if you have some specific questions about flight planning for GCS or features that it has, then just keep them in mind, put them in the Q&A, and then I'll be able to answer them. And so for the corridor scan, it's quite similar. So there, again, you just press here on the plus button. Then you go here to this uh, window that allows you to create uh, a new route. Click next. Uh, then you need to choose what drone do you want to create this route for. I'll just, again, choose DJI M300 drone. And so now uh, let's maybe actually already start with the uh, calibration pattern at the very beginning. Let's maybe move it to a slightly different location. For example, here, let's say we need to scan with LiDAR this whole road. And maybe we will be taking off from this location here. So for that, we can go and first add our pattern action over here. And next, after the pattern action, we can actually proceed with already creating the corridor. So we can press here on LiDAR corridor, and then we can also enter our desired flight height. We can enter the field of view angle for the sensor. And so with this information, we can proceed with creating it. So the creation of corridor is quite similar to the area, except that, of course, you'll only be able, to, you'll only be adding these single points. So the way I'm doing this usually is just like, in general, first click uh, and place the points kind of roughly, you know, where you want them to be. And then once you're done with that, press on enter. Here, let's just click on, okay. And so now once it's calculated, you can see in this case, the corridor is only going in one direction. If you want it to go in uh, two, three, or even more, then you can increase the width of the corridor. In this case, I'll see what hundred meters, uh, what a width of 100 meters will give us. And so here you can see that the corridor now as well is going in two directions. And then additionally, when you need the drone to, for example, follow a certain point uh, or certain line more accurately, for example, here you can see how the road kind of diverges. You can take the point that's here in the middle, move it over here and do the same with any other point star in the middle of these lines. And you can basically make as many adjustments like this as necessary to make the corridor correspond better to uh, whatever linear object it is that you're surveying, whether it's power lines, maybe some river, a road. So you have all these features here in UGCS. So now I think the corridor should be calculated. Let's wait a bit, yep. And so then finally, we can add another pattern action after the corridor is done here. Uh, here, I will need to, I believe, specify the width of, let's say, 20 and then I think yeah this should be good yep and then of course in the corridor you can add other actions for example if you're using DJI L1 LiDAR there you can also add the possibility to trigger the camera so that you can generate the colorized point cloud and there's so many other features features I could talk about I could probably go on for uh, hours about this but I think now it's maybe time to uh, pass the torch on to Maxim from Top of Drone. And to th those of you who have some questions about EGCS in the future, uh, well, I mean, further in the webinar, I'll answer some of them they see now here in text and some others I'll answer in the Q&A. So, uh, Maxim, now the floor yeah. is yours. Thank you, Christoph. Thank you for a good presentation. It was very useful for me. And as soon as we are using uh, UGCS every day during testing of our LiDAR system and when we provide training for our clients. And today I'm going to talk about LiDAR survey. And first of all, my presentation will, uh, I would like to describe my presentation, how, how I will arrange it. First of all, I will uh, show uh, all kind of LiDAR system which, uh, which uh, were designed and produced by, uh, by uh, Top of drone, and after that, uh, I will let uh, my my friend and uh, our very professional uh, user from Costa Rica to make a presentation about real real uh, survey project, which is uh, which we were made uh, by Top of drone lidar system, and uh, we process data together with Eduardo, and Eduardo will uh, follow my presentation. So Eduardo, uh, and um, uh, if you have any questions. Uh, be free to ask me any question during my presentation. I will try to answer it, and it will help me to arrange presentation in a better way 
if you make uh, if you if you provide uh, uh, live questions as well. And of course, Eduardo will answer your questions uh, uh, from his real uh, uh, his, from his real experience of using UGCS for mission planning in the very hard to reach areas of Costa Rica. And uh, he will answer questions about using lighter systems and how it should be used in the dense forest uh, areas, in the mountain areas, how to fly without any connection to the drone, how to fly without any connection to the internet. And of course, in all these cases, UGCS helps us to prepare mission and to drive the drone without any um, um, accidents. So uh, let me start my presentation. And if you have questions, feel free to, uh, to, to ask them. Um, OK. I will share my screen. As you know, Topadron produces a wide range of LiDAR systems, which are, which, are, which are based on Velodyne sensors and LIVOX sensors. And right now, we cover a, a whole range of, uh, of uh, different, uh, uh, we, we cover a whole range of usability of our sensor. First of all, we offer uh, LiDAR AVIA. It's uh, the most affordable LiDAR solution, which is based on a LIVOX sensor. And it has a high precision Honeywell IMU inside, the Genesis receiver inside, and microcomputer. And it works much uh, faster uh, in comparison with DJI L1. Why? Because with using of, uh, of any of our LiDAR system, as well as the LiVox area, you are not, uh, it is not necessary to make so many calibration patterns of the trajectory. Uh, it is uh, as soon as we use high precision IMU inside and Genesis receiver inside, it's not necessary to stop every 100 minutes, uh, every 100 seconds the drone and start uh, um, special calibration patterns of the trajectory. Uh, and if you compare with DJI L1, which uses the same live sensor, you will you will have to stop the drone in the 100 seconds. And you will have to stop the drone every uh, turning part of trajectory and start to move special calibration uh, 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 patterns. So in this case, uh, our LiDAR si system, even uh, which is based on live sensor, provides better, uh, much higher efficiency and better accuracy as soon as we use uh, more, uh, more powerful uh, components like IMU and Genesis receivers. And of course, we work with the Velodyne. Velodyne is our major supplier of uh, lighter sensors. And we, uh, we have a wide range of sensors started from uh, Topadron LiDAR High res which uh, is the most affordable uh, Velodyne uh, sensor, but it's, uh, it's, it was specially designed for mapping. And we use a specially calibrated Velodyne sensor inside. So it provides a very good and accurate point cloud uh, and uh, has all advantages of high precision IMU and Genesis inside. And of course, we use uh, and we uh, offer and widely use uh, Tapadron LiDAR 200 Ultra, which uh, works uh, up to 200 meters altitude, up to 200 meters walking range, and, uh, and it covers a huge area and it provides a great, uh, uh, great results for large area mapping. And of course, we use uh, uh, HDL sensor, which was uh, first designed for mapping by Velodyne. And it has uh, great results in, uh, in terms of accuracy, in terms of density of point cloud, in terms of minim uh, minimum level of noise. But it, it has a little bit higher price. And if we compare all these sensors, I would say that uh, Tapadron LiDAR area has uh, the most affordable price, but uh, less efficient. Uh, Tapadron LiDAR uh, Harris provides uh, high quality of point cloud, and it is more efficient in comparison with uh, LiDAR area, and it has a little bit higher price. And Tapadron LiDAR 200 uh, Ultra provides the most efficient uh, capabilities of the LiDAR, and it uh, can work for, uh, from the higher altitude, which is very important uh, if you fly in the mountain areas. Uh, but uh, uh, it has a higher price. And of course, if you need the, the most uh, powerful, the most accurate results, uh, uh, you, you, you should look at uh, Tapadron HDL sensor. And of course, uh, and uh, just a uh, few months before, we, um, we, um, we created a new one solution. Uh, which walks up to 300 meters altitude, which can be installed uh, on uh, 
helicopter, electric helicopter, and which can fly with uh, more than one uh, one hour and five uh, one hour and a half, and uh, can cover more than uh, several square kilometers, more than five or ten square kilometers per flight with a high precision lidar data. And um, uh, we will show all this equipment on Intergeo, and we will uh, we. We invite you to visit our stand, and on our stand you will find uh, some of our users who are, uh, who have been already using our uh, lidar system. And I think some guys from UGCS will come to the stand, and you will um, you will find a lot of uh, uh, information, and you will find some interesting uh, um, uh, products which will be uh, uh, announced on Intergel as well. And um, of course, all our lidar system can be uh, combined with uh, cameras and uh, Topadron uh, design and produce two types of cameras, 24 megapixel cameras and 61 megapixel cameras, which can be installed on Matrix 200, Matrix 300. Uh, it provides better uh, better uh, 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 quality of the images in comparison with uh, original digital, DJI solution because it has a wide working range uh, uh, as soon as we use uh, Sony sensors and it provides 61 megapixel resolution. So you can fly higher, you can change uh, lenses and you will cover a bigger area with, uh, uh, with the better data sets. And the main advantage of these cameras uh, uh, that you, uh, it is possible to change lens from uh, RGB original lens, so like uh, 24 millimeters, 80 millimeters, or 35 millimeters to multispectral lens. And from the same cam camera, you will, ca you will capture multispectral data, RGB data, and you have a great flexibility in the field. And you have a great coverage of the data. And of course, the resolution of the data is uh, much higher in comparison with DJI P1 or any other sensors which are available uh, for DJI Matrix 200 or Matrix uh, 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 free hand. Um, and of course, all these cameras pro provides uh, uh, a real video link and it can be combined with a LiDAR. And when you make a LiDAR survey, you can see, see on the screen, you can watch on the screen what you are capturing right now, what is the quality of the data and so on. So it, it has very powerful solution for you. And of course, all our LiDAR Lighters can be installed not only on the drone, but it can be installed on the car or, in, or, or on the backpack. And if we compare data set, which is which are captured data sets which are captured from the drone or from the car, you will see that it can be combined together, and you will cover a uh, forest uh, from from uh, high altitude with the drone, and you will cover roofs and so on. And after that, you can make survey from the car, for example, and you will catch small details which are close to the ground. You will catch very high precision data sets from the ground. It, it, it is amazing advantage of our LiDAR system. Uh, not only the efficiency the, of our LiDAR system, but additionally, you can change the way how to use it. You, you are flexible to change the payload from the drone to car or any backpack, and you have a great flexibility as well. So, and uh, right now, uh, today I'm not going to uh, to show how to process data. Maybe in some uh, today I make some announcement of our new uh, features of our software, which was designed especially for Eduardo when he made a huge project of lidar survey in Costa Rica, and he asked us to help us to process data when he uh, had more than 30 flights. In this case, we designed a special workflow, which right now uh, which will be available for all our customers. Uh, within a few days, and which this workflow helps to process all data sets from 30 flights uh, in, in one click. So you don't need to do anything, just to upload all data sets, uh, and all data sets will be processed automatically. You will generate point cloud automatically, you will calibrate the LiDAR automatically, and make triple alignment automatically. So you don't need to use any additional software to make a strip alignment or LiDAR calibration. Everything is included in our Topadron post-processing software. And of course, uh, and of course um, it has a batch processing. So you can add a lot of flights in one data set and you will process all flights together. So Eduardo, could you show uh, us a real, ah, and what I forgot to describe. First of all, I would like to describe, uh, introduce Eduardo. And uh, uh, I know him for maybe, uh, for maybe four or five years. And first time 
he uh, he arrived to our training in Finland. We probably and in the heavy um, heavy winter, Eduardo uh, arrived to Finland to uh, to pass our training for photogrammetry survey. And we and those time, Eduardo, to tell the truth, he didn't know anything about real photogrammetry. He didn't know anything about re uh, real workflow of data processing when you don't use any GCPs, just to use only onboard PPK system, just to use camera and how to get accurate results. And after uh, this training, Eduardo decided to buy our uh, camera, X4S camera, which was uh, compatible with uh, a Matrix 200 drone. In within a few years, he had a lot of jobs which was performed in uh, Costa Rica. And you know, in Costa Rica, there are a lot of rainforests and it is difficult to reach the place as you can see on, uh, on this photo. And uh, it's very difficult to place any GCPs. In this case, Eduardo was interested in our PPK solution for photogrammetry. And after the training, he, know, uh, he, he, got know, he got know how to process the data. And within a few years, he got a lot, a lot of projects, successfully, uh, uh, successfully realized projects, uh, accomplished projects. And after that, he chose our LiDAR system and, uh, for LiDAR survey. And uh, he came to us to Switzerland and uh, we spent maybe three or five days. We provide all kinds of training, how to use the lighter, how to make a calibration, how to plan the mission in UGCS. And in, in, the, uh, in those time, we already realized that only UGCS can provide you efficient tools for mission planning. In case if you fly in the mountains, in case if you fly in forest areas, and of course, for lighter missions in, in those times, we use uh, UGCS Pro software and we, need, and we have had to create all calibration patterns manually. It was a little bit uh, complicated and it was a little bit tricky, but right now we use UGCS Expert, which is much easier and much, uh, uh, much easier uh, to create all parts of lighter uh, trajectory. And, uh, uh, and finally, after the training, Eduard uh, left Switzerland and within a few years, he made a lot of great projects of LiDAR survey. And one of these projects will be shown by Eduardo today. And uh, if you have any questions, uh, I will answer or Eduardo answer. And I will show some new parts of our software during this presentation as well. So Eduardo, could you start your presentation? Thank you, Maxim. Thank you, Christoph. Well, yes, so uh, Maxime made a, made a short power journey again and how we started using the Yeah, here. I will stop sharing and uh, you are welcome to share on the presentation. And, um, and how we started our, our journey with them. So right now we wanted to share this project, but it was, it was kind of challenging at first because when we got there, the forest was just, it was just very dense. Okay, you can see, let me stop sharing here. All right, you can see that um, in Costa Rica, we have only two uh, weather seasons. We have rainy season or dry season. So probably the best time to do these things is on the dry season because there is less forest cover, but uh, many people need to run these tests during the winter so they can build during the summertime. So it was really hard for us to get all this um, information gathered quickly and accurately with, without um, LIDAR. That's why we started on um, going through all of these equipment. And in this particular project, it, it was very important to get it done quickly doing because it, it's very, it's going to be a very big land plot and they have a lot of permits to go through. So that's why they chose us for the project. Our company's name is Survey Corp. They had seen, they had uh, been in touch with some of our previous customers and they got a few recommendations. So when we got to the job site, as you can see here on our image on the right, it was all, all covered by trees. So that made our, our assessment to the, to the job change dramatically because we had to just take the drone uh, to fly lower, to fly um, at, a, at a low speed of say at seven meters per second is how we were flying between five and seven. And we kept the drone between 40 and 50 meters above ground. It was very important to not go over those 50 meters because we needed to get the, the richest um, quality, the best quality that we could get 
to process our results. Now, um, I, I have been using the UGCS experts for this. We started with, with uh, back then with, uh, with UGCS for doing the photogrammetry. And I really, I was really satisfied with the results of UGCS photogrammetry. So we chose it again for the LIDAR surveys. And this right here, you can see is the entire area. Okay, it, it's, it's divided into three, into three sectors. There's, a, there's sector number one, one that you can see right there. That one was not so complicated to fly from because we, could, we had a nice uh, place for our truck so we could just take off from the truck and we had a nice, a nice, a nice spot for the base station. But we came to the second spot, which is this one I'm showing you right here. It was, it was a mountain region. We had to, to go there on, on horses. Now we have before, you uh, flown beyond line of sight part of, our, part of our missions, but we didn't do this on this time because the trees here were very tall and we wanted to be able to take over the drone just in case it was gonna hit a very tall tree. And we had to take over twice because of uh, the mountain regions, there were just some very, very, very tall trees. So um, we used on we used, um, the horses to get there and, and the third option, the, the third sector is this one right here, where you can see that we had to drive completely around the mountain. And it was really, uh, let's say not challenging, but it took some, some logistics to get the drone to fly 200 meters uh, difference in height and still get uh, you know, battery time and get enough area when we were surveying. A total of 35 flights um, took us to do this job. I mean, we could have done it like in less light, so we would have picked up the pace on the drone and picked up the height. But that is not what we were looking for. We were looking for the best results we could possibly get. So this could work for permits. Um, here in Costa Rica, in order for you to get permits for a down development, land development, they need to do an assessment of the trees, of the, of the bodies of water. There's three large bodies of water there. And if, if there's going to be any earth movements, they got to be they got to be recorded prior to that. And, there, the pre-design of the land plot must be submitted. So this is why we needed this to be um, the best it could be. Like we need to make, we need to maximize the use of our tools. So when we finished, um, when we were when we were working on the field, we we're like, well, it's going to take some time processing. <laughs> That's the first thing that came into our mind. So there's when there's where I talked to Mancina and said. Maxima and was like, okay, um, we might need some help on this so we can do it quickly and not take too long. So um, Maxime came, came up with a suggestion. He said, well, we're just going to speed up what they, they have been working on before so we can process this um, quicker and you don't have to be doing one by one, which takes a lot longer. We need to be, the other thing we have here is that we're working on the rainy season. So it's not like we could fly all day. We could have two or three flights per day, so we needed to be able to check the information so quickly, so just in case we have to cover an area again, it would be much easier. So as you can see, um, it was it was really, well, I, I can show on this, on the screenshot is how, how the, the, we can process all the flights at once, so you can see all the waypoints. We have a, we have a blank spot right there, but it was just like deselected it when it, the, the screenshot, but it's, we covered all the area. This is the point cloud. We, we gathered. On the left side, you can see there's a, a, a big body of water, a river, and it floods in the, in the rainy season considerably. So they needed this to be very accurate so they could run simulations to see where is the danger zone and where is not the danger zone where they can safely build. As you can see here are part of our results. Um, to be honest, I was, I, was, um, I was thinking that this was very covered in trees. And uh, we might, we might, we might uh, not get as good results. That's why we flew so low and flew slower. And we were actually very satisfied and impressed with the results. Not only what we got from the point cloud and LIDAR, but how accurate it was for UGCS to fly with us. There was um, a tower, there was, there was a, a communications tower at some point that we had to avoid. And it was very, um, useful to have the no-fly zone feature on UGCS. So we were flying the mission and we just avoided 
the dangerous parts. Well, then this is the, 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 the elevations model of the entire um, process that we did. This is like one of our final products. As you can see, we covered the entire area. The area of interest was 235 hectares, but we surveyed a total of 335. So the main reason is that we needed to know outside of the boundary, how was the water coming into the property? If, they, if it was flat or if it was a hill or if it was um, uh, a, a, dif a, a different kind of change in elevations. So out of the boundary, we moved about 150 meters. If we would have had to do this on foot, it would have taken a, a long time and probably we wouldn't have been able to take so much information from outside of the boundary because it would require a lot of work of walking and going back and forth and getting permission from everybody. So we just talked to the neighbors and said, the drone's gonna be flying. We showed them our permits and they were like, fine, everybody cooperated. And this is the, the, the elevation model from uh, consisting also with the trees and all the layers in there without the, the ground. I mean, with everything, this is not the part where we clean the ground, this just has everything, the trees and all the building and et cetera. And this is our final result. <laughs> This is the contour lines. This is exactly what they, they they required from us. So the developer could decide where which were the better. Eduardo, could you show? Or... Excuse me. Eduardo, could you show the contour lines? Yeah, That's super. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so right here in the contour lines, this is our um, this is our final uh, our final product. What our customer wanted, and as you can see, there is a lot of detail in this and we that went to the field and the, and the customer that knows the field, when he looks at this, he knows that this is what the property looks like. We don't have any blank spots or anything. You can say, no, this is uh, inaccurate, but no, it really, we are really satisfied with, uh, with the outcome. So here you can see all the mountain ridges, all the lines. It, can, it, it was really effective for um, giving a simulation of, of, of the river when it when it just floods so they can definitely realize or take a decision how to assess the river and how to maximize the land plots basically i'm putting it really close together this is um the, the project that we did but um it took us a lot of days it took us about uh three weeks to do this even though for a lighter it's small but we had to do many flights to get the best information possible and we are actually pretty satisfied with it because we got the most out of it and the drone and the, the sensor everything worked the way it was supposed to work so it let us mind or worry about what was important for us at that moment that was getting the work done you know we didn't have to battle with any of the equipment so i'll go ahead maxine you can take it out from here anybody have any questions you can also uh yeah actually uh, i think Thank you, Eduardo, for uh, the presentation. I think maybe uh, you would be the person who could also answer the question. It's been sitting there in the Q&A for a while. And and by the way, a reminder for the rest of you guys, I see somebody also raised a hand, like, please uh, put the questions in the Q&A, uh, and then we will go through them uh, one by one and answer them. Uh, so one of the questions is, so uh, maybe, Eduardo, you can like comment a bit on what are the best practices when you have to deal with uh, large terrain changes and varying tall trees. I know you mentioned this in your presentation and uh, your speech, but maybe you can like explain again, let's say for somebody who's not that experienced maybe with uh, drones or LIDARs for like a, a newcomer, for example, um, what would be your recommendations after, you know, this whole experience, how to uh, what would be the safest manners how to fly to uh, to take into account, you know, large terrain changes and uh, potentially tall trees? Okay, um, for the large for the large terrain changes, my recommendation is that as much as it, it's possible, because I know it's not possible all the time, but as much as it's possible, and you can you can fly parallel to the changes in terrain and not straight forward to them. When you're when you're going parallel to the terrain, the the changes of the flight path are not as abrupt as if you're going straight forward to it. So it not only keeps the drone more stable, but it helps you. Um, it, it helps the sensor collect a more precise point cloud because you're not having all those jumps. 
Now with the trees, with the trees is a good question. I mean, uh, we had to take over the, the drone twice, right? Because there were some very tall trees. It is kind of tricky sometimes. You just have to, for example, here in Costa Rica, we don't have trees that are taller than 35 or 40 meters. So basically you could be safe if you're flying between 40 and 50 meters. But this becomes a challenge when you're in a mountain range. So if you have mountains and you have to fly the drone straight towards the mountain, it's a little more dangerous if you, if you, to hit a tree. But if you're going parallel to the mountain, it'll be easier for you to assess in every turn where is the next danger. Because when you're the, the, when you're, you're going parallel to the mountain, the drone goes. Let's say if you're if you're going from top to bottom, every time the drone goes down, you can see the t the trees on the turns. So the two times we had to take over the drone we already knew that was going to be a problem a tree that, that there was going to be a problem there we were close to hitting trees about 15 times because we, we were flying very low but since we were flying parallel to the to, to the changes in terrain right when the drone makes the turn you can see when is the when is the next path going to be so you can expect you can be ready to see if you're going to take control now we only had to do it twice because um the missions were planned correctly and the drone would just gain altitude quickly. There was just these trees that were just amazingly high, and we knew we were ready for it, that when the turn was, when the drone was gonna turn, we were probably gonna have to take it over manually, and we did in these two times. Uh, it wasn't dangerous at all. I mean, the, the sensors and the drone, even though it's, uh, we used an M210, that is not um, such so advanced as an M300 with the obstacle avoidance system, uh, it's still the M210 worked perfectly. It noticed the trees, it slowed down. We took over safely, <clears throat> replanned that mission. And in that area specifically, we flew a little higher. But in the end, it was pretty safe. You know, spe specifically when you're flying slow, it gives the drone and the sensors uh, to time to work. Not if you're flying a little faster, probably takes a little longer. But I. Uh, I would say it was pretty safe. I mean, all of our equipment was safe in every single spot, in every single survey that we were doing. I don't know if I, uh, if I answered your question or would you like, uh, do you have any other questions about that subject well, specific? Uh, I think for now, let's consider this question answered. And, you know, uh, if to the person who asked that, if you have any more like additional questions to Eduardo, then like, please feel free to add them. Uh, another question we have for you, Eduardo, is so did you have any instances where the drone went out of uh, visual line of sight or did you always keep it within line of sight? Okay, well, my drone was um, was beyond line of sight for a lot of time, most of this, but I had a solid connection. I, I um, We have a range extender uh, from a third party on our controllers. So we were surrounded surrounded by trees most of the time. I couldn't see the drone, but we had a solid connection with the controller. I'm not sure if we would have had the same results with the standard antenna, but with the range extender, I have, I mean, it gives a very solid um, connection to the drone where you have, you, you really can't see it because um, in a flight pass, our drone had to fly uh, one kilometer before it began. And you ask, well, why do you have to fly it an entire kilometer before you start the survey? Don't, can't you get closer? Well, we couldn't get closer. It was, it was, it was, it was, the cliffs were very high. And the drone, the, the forest was very dense. And getting there would just take um, two, three, four, four hours to get three, four flights out of the day. So it was just better to fly um, from a distance where we could recover the drone, get it charged quickly, and probably do more missions, you know. But it would be more time and cost effective and safe because uh, part of the things that we deal with in when you do this kind of work in this area in this part of the world is safety there's there's snakes you know there's um in in this in this type of forest if, when you're walking around there's things that can fall so when you have this expensive equipment and this delicate gear you don't want you want to avoid danger as much as you can so for us, it, was, it meant to at least have to do a few extra flights because the drone was going to lose a lot, a, lot of, a lot of work time getting to, a, to the job site. But it was the safest way in order to protect the drone and to protect also us in order to be able to complete the job.
job. Right. It's, actually, it's actually quite an interesting point I think you made that like in, in these kinds of uh, locations, you need to worry not only about, you know, the drone's safety, but also your own safety as well, you know, due to the environment around you. Exactly. Okay, so this also I'll mark now as answered. Uh, there's another question regarding the ideal height of the flight plan, but I remember you mentioned this, that like in most cases there you flew at uh, 45 to 50 meters. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Yes, yeah, so, um, we were between, um, when we were doing the mission planning, I planned it um, between 40 and 48 meters. And in the, in the, in, in the job done, like in the real, world it was done between 38 and 47 meters we were very close to the trees at some points right but um as i was mentioning we just we really wanted to get the best results we could and um in order to get good results you need to fly low and if you can go not so fast just try to go slow and that's what we did that's why in this area that is really not that big because we have surveyed larger areas but we chose this one because we needed a lot of detail and it was, there was a lot of forest. I mean, there was a part of the, of the, of the land plot, sector three, there's probably a primary rainforest. There has, there has never been anyone there doing anything but a small trail for the owner to keep, keep the property lines clean. So we really wanted to keep below 50 meters and above 37, 38, so our, our gear would be safe. Okay, all right, thank you. So I'll mark this one as answered as well. Um, by the way, maybe to also kind of address the um, the questions about the altitude and also about the obstacles, I'll just mention from my side as well, um, because uh, we also have had some experience flying in remote areas. Uh, for example, some of my colleagues were in Papua New Guinea, where they also flew with uh, drones with LiDAR. And one of the things we learned there is that it's very useful if you already have, firstly, um, in addition to the default, uh, turn elevation model that we have. If you're flying in very complex areas where you know the drone might get close to trees at some points, first thing, it's good to have uh, another uh, digital elevation model of the area. And plus, in addition to that, a digital surface model, because this will allow you to also understand, uh, you know, at what height will the trees be. Of course, it, this isn't always possible to get such a model uh, if you're flying over very large areas, but you can still at least maybe fly a bit higher, get some preliminary model, which you can then use for flight planning or just to make sure that, uh, you know, the flight won't get really too close. So one thing we did is that um, if you have both of those models, so terrain elevation and uh, digital surface model, so then first you can construct your flight uh, with respect to terrain elevation model, then you can go ahead and convert the whole flight from AGL to MSL altitude, so the altitude won't change, and then you can import the uh, terrain, uh, sorry, the digital surface model. And so then basically this allows you to compare the height of each point as it will be MSL, so it won't really take into account the digital surface model. So when you see the elevation profile, you'll be able to see the difference between the each of the points as well as the digital surface models this will also give you a bit more assurance you know to make sure that uh you won't really get too close to any obstacles that are there um okay so another question i see is um what did you use for positioning in that location did you use uh rtk base station or ppk um uh, so what was the uh, setup there for positioning Oh, we use the PPK. Um, we first, uh, we, we used the GNSS base station. We fixed our point to the ground, right? There, there's, there, there are two base stations we used. <clears throat> with one of the base stations, we, we flew sector one and two, and with uh, the other base station, we flew sector C. Since we would have to go around just too much to go and put, start the base station B, again, that would take us three or four hours just to fly. So that's why we used another one. So we fixed our base station and we used our base station there and we start, we, we got to uh, record raw data, let's say Ryanix. So we could do PPK with what we have with the GNSS receiver we have on a lighter sensor. So our positioning our positioning was PPK. After we do all the, all the workflow, we let's say our anchor ground point is the point we had already fixed where we put our base station. Mm -hmm. All right. 
Uh, and then two questions about, I'll, I'll just kind of try to combine two questions together in one. This is concerning the LiDAR sensors. Maybe, uh, Max, you can try to take this. So first one is, so how many returns does that LiDAR sensor have uh, that was used for the project? And second one uh, from another uh, viewer is, uh, what's the point points per second for that LiDAR? So how many returns and what's the uh, points per second? Okay, so uh, uh, to answer this, uh, I can answer this question in two types. First of all, like uh, from a technical point of view, uh, our sensor has two returns or three returns, uh, and you can capture two or three returns. But in reality, it totally doesn't matter if you use three returns or two returns. The most important issue is the high, how, how accurate is your return. And sometimes you can capture a million of points and finally, all these points will be noise. And you can check it on a hard surface, or you can check it on the trees when, uh, or on the power line uh, poles when the, uh, the, the diameter of the tree or power line poles became two, two, uh, two times uh, bigger than in reality. And the same situation in the level of noise on the ground. Or, so I wouldn't suggest to, to look at uh, the uh, technical uh, conditions like uh, how many returns. You should look on the quality of the point cloud, the number of noise, and how uh, how is uh, uh, how the lidar penetrates uh, the forest. For example, we have two different lidar systems. First of all, it, it's in one, and another one. Uh, first of all, is Livox, and another one is Veladine sensor. All these systems has two different uh, uh, different kind of capturing of the data. For example, Veladine sensor has a rotation part of the uh, lidar. And it, it rotates on 360 degrees. And after that, you can capture lighter point cloud from different points of view. As a result, you, uh, you will get uh, uh, a little bit different point cloud. And if we compare with the uh, LiveOx, if you use the uh, accurate, uh, uh, accurate uh, there are two, uh, two, uh, two ways how to capture data in LiveOx. And if you use uh, accurate data capturing with a low level of noise, you will catch just on only a thin, uh, thin line of point clouds. As a result, number of points will under the under the trees will be less. As a result, uh, the uh, the representation of the objects will be not so clear. And this is the difference. And uh, not, in in reality, in, uh, in in reality, number of uh, number of uh, returns, if it is two or three, it doesn't matter at all. And uh, the same situation is how many points per second you will get. It's a simple question, but how many real points of the uh, under the ground you will get? How many uh, real points on the trees you will get, which shows you the range, or if it shows the real uh, um, uh, power uh, power line pole? This is the difference. And when you evaluate the quality of the lighter system, you need to check the quality of the point cloud and check the distance between objects, uh, check the a level of noise without filtering, because of course uh, there are a lot of software can, which can filter the point cloud, and you will get very thin solution. But in reality, it's like half of the meter. It's uh, so it's um, you need to check the quality of the data, and you need to evaluate the quality of the point cloud. It's the best uh, option, not to look at uh, technical requirements like uh, distance of uh, walking distance of the lighter, like some some. Uh, uh, manufacturer shows it like 300 meters, but in reality, it doesn't work on, on 120 meters. And in an accurate point cloud, you will get in 50 meters altitude. And it's very good example that Christoph said that uh, when they walk, uh, when uh, uh, SHP engineering walk in uh, Papua Nova Guinea, it was a very beautiful project when they fly over the dense uh, rainforest and they were looking for some objects under the trees. Uh, which were stored for a long time. And for that, they use uh, our Topadron LiDAR 200 to fly over the forest to capture preliminary, uh, preliminary model of the, uh, under the under the trees and to get the uh, altitude of the trees. And after that, they created two different terrain levels. And after that, they, they were able to fly lower as exactly on, uh, 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 on a uh, very low altitude under the trees to capture everything under the trees. And after that, we finally found what they are looking for, as I, as I know. 
and it was a very amazing project. And some, uh, I, I, I hope that uh, uh, SHP Engineering and uh, UGCS team will show the results of this project and how they use top of the LiDAR 200 for, for such heavy, uh, heavy to penetrate uh, forest area. So this is yep. awesome. Yep. All right. So thank you for the answer. And uh, I'll try to answer another one, the questions that's here. And I think it was actually asked by two separate viewers. So I think it just makes sense to address. Uh, so question is basically about how can you, let's say when the terrain is quite rough, how can you adjust uh, the accuracy at which the uh, software follows the changes in the terrain? And I just quickly want to show you an example of how this can be done. So here you can see this is the... Uh, I uh, hope you can see GCS screen. You should be able to. So this is the LiDAR area scan that we constructed earlier. And so now, again, if we go here into show elevation, so uh, this is the, uh, oh, sorry, this is for the corridor scan. This should be for the uh, area scan. So yeah, we go here. And so this is the uh, elevation profile that you can see of this route. Uh, so there is a way how you can adjust how accurately it is following the terrain. And this is actually done using the following parameter, the AGL tolerance. So you can see that currently the AGL tolerance parameter is set to three meters. So this basically means that uh, if the terrain changes by more than three meters between two points, then the GCS uh, algorithm will insert an additional point in between. But if the changes in the terrain are less than that, then uh, no additional points will be inserted. And so as an example, you can see here, uh, this is the ladder area. And so, for example, we have 123 uh, waypoints currently. So now if we want to change this, then uh, if we want to change the accuracy, which the drone follows, for example, if we now change the HL tolerance to five meters, we should now, in result, you can see now we are getting less waypoints. So for example, now we're getting 111 waypoints. And if we increase this even more, let's say it's maybe eight meters, so now an additional waypoint will be placed only if the terrain changes by more than that. And again, so here you can see that now we only have 101 waypoint in the whole mission. So now the drone is not following the terrain as accurately. So if you're flying over some areas where you know that there will be you know, quite, um, quite large changes in there, or it will simply be rough according to the terrain elevation model, then in those cases you can play around with this parameter or uh, on the opposite side if you want the drone to follow the terrain more accurately than it is than the mission is constructed then you can for example uh so let me just select this one so then you can for example enter the agl tolerance of something like one meter and so now the drone will follow the terrain at quite high degree of accuracy you can see now our waypoint count is 157. so yeah i just wanted to answer this question as well um so this question was also asked by will here so yeah basically uh like you said so this is somewhat of a drape uh over the elevation model that the drone is following when it is flying um another thing since i'm come here uh while we're here on the gcs i'll just quickly show you uh how you can add custom elevations so here if you go to map options then map layers window so then here in this tab of elevation this is where you can add this so you can add your own uh turn elevation sources which you can then use to see at what altitude will the drone be i don't have any prepared now unfortunately uh but uh if you join tomorrow's webinar i might prepare some for that uh but yeah there basically uh like i said you can first use uh, a digital elevation model for, for calculating the flight itself or you can use the default one if that's okay in your location and then uh, if you have some preliminary digital surface model that like, you know, some rough estimate of where the tops of the trees are, then you can also create a, a digital surface model, import this into GCS. You can import this as a GeoTIFF file, for example. And then after you have converted the route to a missile altitude, you'll be able to see the difference between the point and the elevation. So I hope that that answers that question as well. So let's see what other Christos, questions we have. Um, Christos, I, I saw a lot of questions about uh, LiDAR system and can I, uh, can I answer to them? Yeah, of course, uh, go ahead. Just the uh, first question, what, uh, what is GNSS and IMU used uh, by Topa drone for precise regulatory estimation? So uh, first of all, um, I would like to, 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 to describe the history how we designed the system. 
uh, as you know, Tepadron produce high precision PPK equipment, uh, which can be installed in any kind of DJI drone or an outlet drone to convert uh, consumer drones to precise uh, survey tool. And after that, we decided that we can uh, create something bigger, not only in PPK system, not, not only our own necessary series. And uh, in, in those time, it was uh, several years ago, the representative of Honeywell, which was based in Switzerland, close to, to our office, came to us. And uh, we decided to create our own solution for, uh, to combine Genesis and IMU. And uh, within the, uh, one year, we worked closely together with Honeywell. And finally, we created a special uh, motherboard, which can include a Genesis receiver and any type of Honeywell IMUs and microcomputer to, to combine all type of uh, equipment together and, it took, and to get very accurate results. And uh, our aim was to create very affordable solution for LiDAR uh, survey and for any kind of uh, survey like uh, Bathymetric survey as well, uh, just to, uh, just to, uh, but with the less level of price uh, if we compare with Zaplanic systems. And finally, with, after one year of development, we achieved a great results, which right now you can see in uh, all our LiDAR systems. As a result, we have very low cost solution in comparison with our uh, another one LiDAR system. But we use high precision Honeywell IMUs or Epson IMUs right now and uh, build by us GNSS receiver and build by us all, uh, all equipment inside. So this is the answer. We're not only using uh, ready to use equipment, we design our own solution, which help us to keep all prices uh, on very, uh, very affordable level. And as a result, you, you will get very accurate uh, data sets. And I can show you the data processing, which is very interesting. And I would like to show uh, some parts of data processing. Oh, I couldn't start sharing. Oh, yeah, that's because uh, I'm sharing the screen. Uh, I'll now stop it. So go ahead, Max, and uh, yeah, share. I, what, what I would like to show, how to post-process data. It's very simple. Uh, what you need, uh, you need to just run our software uh, where is it? Uh, we, you need to just run our software. In our software, you will choose data set from the LiDAR, any type of, uh, you will choose uh, uh, data set from the LiDAR. After that, you, you can add the uh, offset of the antenna. It's very simple. Uh, and finally, you will add base station file, nothing else. If you, uh, if you have already a base station file, uh, with uh, precise coordinates inside. In this case, uh, uh, you don't need to change coordinates of the base station. But what, what more? You can process together uh, different uh, flights together. So you can add additional flights uh, just to, just to uh, you can add additional flights, for example. And uh, all these flights will be processed automatically. On the map, you can see base station, location of the base station, and starting point of the flights as well. And after that, you just need to, uh, to run post-processing. Within a few minutes, you will get accurate results. And after that, as soon as you uh, uh, calculate trajectory of the flight, within a few minutes, you can calibrate the LiDAR and you can uh, create point cloud in automatic mode. Um, we just wait for, for one or two minutes to get one of trajectory. And after that, we can run point cloud calibration. And maybe I will uh, stop for uh, uh, post-processing because the result you will get a trajectory. It's very simple. But I would like to show how easy it is to calibrate the LiDAR and how to easy to make strip alignment. It's really easy task. What I need uh, to do is just to stop it. Uh, just to stop. Uh, yeah, and I will and I will run uh, uh, point cloud uh, generation. It's very simple. First of all, we, we choose the data set. After that, we can choose a trajectory file which was created by our software. After that, it's possible to remove all uh, unnecessary part of trajectory, which uh, which is uh, which is not necessary to uh, to generate. And finally, uh, and finally, you can choose uh, special options. First of all, you can uh, make a strip alignment for the first data set to calibrate calibration angles for your flights. 
And after that, um, uh, you will uh, you will select uh, type of the lighter. And after that, you can add additional flights. And you can add as more flights as you want from the same uh, uh, from the same uh, from the same uh, flight area or from any other flight area. And as soon as we use uh, uh, a very uh, accurate and stable IMU, angles of of the lidar, uh, calibrated angles of the lidar, will be the same. And you don't need to sp uh, spend a lot of time. You will uh, you will create a georeferenced lidar point cloud. Uh, automatically, uh, you will create georeferenced point cloud auto automatically. And what you need just to need to choose the projection, for example, Costa Rica. And we created this option to make automatic strip alignment, especially for Eduardo, which I would like to show you today. That uh, uh, he he made more than thirty flights. And if we if we process data step by step from uh, one by by one, it takes a lot of time. But we can add all your flights together, like uh, you can see on the, our screenshot. And after that, we just run uh, point cloud generation and calibrating of the lidar. And there are two options: you can calibrate each flight, or you can calibrate the first flight to calculate angles of uh, calibration angles of the lidar. And after that, you can implement to all flights uh, around this area. And uh, as soon as we use high precision IMU inside, these angles are stable, and all flights will be generated in automatic mode within a few seconds. So right now, you don't need to use any type of LiDAR 360 software, or uh, for example, um, uh, Uh, for example, software for for uh, strip alignment for uh, Terra Match Terra Scan software. You don't need to do it. Everything is included inside of our workflow. You and everything is made totally automatically. And within a few minutes, uh, the system will calibrate your lighter, and after that, it will generate point cloud uh, 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 with using of this calibration information. And all point cloud will be aligned together, and all strips will be aligned together. This is the main advantage of what we made together with, uh, cost, uh, with Eduardo. And finally, uh, as soon as uh, this calibration, um, uh, as soon as this calibration step will be done, you will get georeferenced point point cloud. And what you need just to uh, make uh, terrain extraction to classify flowing cloud, and you, you will get very accurate results. And um, I just, uh, uh, as soon as, it will be calibrated. We will upload the point cloud to any software and we can check strip alignment. And uh, we don't make any additional strip alignment by uh, LiDAR 360, just the way how we represent it. And all strip alignment was done by our software. So no additional steps is necessary. And this is the answer to the question, what kind of IMU we use. We use Honeywell IMU, which are very stable uh, and you can process data set automatically. Uh, by the way, Max, uh, there is a question also from a person asking, is it possible to use your software for DJI L1 uh, processing? Yeah, we, we saw a lot of questions from the guys that uh, sleep alignment uh, doesn't work properly. Uh, why, uh, why it can happen? First of all, it's low quality IMU, which uh, needs uh, to make uh, calibration every 100 seconds. And the second, uh, the second issue, the sensor, and of course, we are developing right now a workflow to use uh, uh, li uh, LiveOx data sets because we use the same sensor like LiveOx area and uh, DJI L1 use the same sensor. So for us, it's not a problem to, uh, to process the data. If you send us your data set, we can process it in our software and after that we will provide the demo license uh, and you can test it as well. So we are, you are always welcome to be better test of our software. And maybe a while uh, this uh, well, software is running, another question we had that was already posted a while ago, uh, what is the point spacing both along and across track? Uh, so um, does it belongs to the distance between uh, uh, Point spacing, point point density. Are you talking about density of the points or uh, distance between flight passes? Uh, I'm assuming this is point uh, density. Point density. Usually we have 
like 300 up from 300 to 600 points per uh, per square meter all right well i hope this answers the question and about the yeah. other one that uh, was there about the how to avoid obstruction i think this was already answered so i'll mark this as answered yeah yeah, yeah. and uh, mm -hmm. it's a very good question how to avoid uh, uh, obstruction and, and and i think it's better when you fly it's better to look at, at uh, fpv camera and if you have camera with the video link on your lidar it will help you to look in both direction, in front of the drone and under the drone. And this is the advantage of our equipment as well, that you can combine a camera which has a video link and you can see, uh, uh, you can watch uh, video, uh, video, um, uh, video from, both, uh, from both directions. Uh, another question there is when will the version with strip uh, aligning, I'm assuming this meant strip alignment, be available? But uh, as yeah, I understand, yeah. you're... Um, uh, uh, we, are going to, uh, we, are we are going to publish this version this week. So right now we are finishing all, uh, all other issues with the software. We have a lot of advantages and um, uh, we will uh, have some improvements as well. And, um, and this week we will publish this version for all of our users and you can use it uh, uh, without any problem. All right, and another one, uh, I think I'll answer this myself. So this is from Wayne. Uh, you're asking about, so uh, are there plans to offer remote triggering of ladder systems so that we can start and stop acquisition during the flight? Um, well, currently I can just mention that uh, with one of the things that I maybe didn't mention with the LiDAR tools is that both in GCS LiDAR area as well as the LiDAR corridor. So uh, by default, they both include uh, automatic actions, which will uh, start the LiDAR recording and stop the LiDAR recording after the flight. So this is also included in those flight paths and you will not see the actions there, but they will happen. So like all you need to do is basically plan either LiDAR area or LiDAR corridor uh, mission and then the LiDAR will start uh, the uh, recording automatically. Yeah, Christophs, uh, you are totally right. What, but what we need to do additionally is to make a better integration between the payload, between the payload and the UGCS. And in this case, it's uh, all you just uh, send the message uh, through uh, export or Skyport for DJI. In this case, we can, uh, we can capture it and we can start and finish survey. But uh, Meanwhile, uh, right now you can cut all unnecessary part of uh, lidar data during post uh, during post processing. You just uh, cut a part of the trajectory, so uh, there is no any problem. But we are looking forward to be, uh, to create a better integration of our, all of our lidar sensors and camera together with UGCS. And I uh, very pleased that you made the support for our cameras to provide video link. It's very very good idea as well. So there's another question. Uh, let me just uh, read this so I can answer. Okay, so it's it's about uh, when you're using terrain following, uh, drones following the uh, flight at a certain altitude and after changing the batteries, uh, the, spec the height was a bit different where the drone returned. Um, I need to see the specific route that she flew and uh, the altitude that was set there. Um, without seeing it, I can't uh, really uh, give much pointers on what could have been the issue. Uh, but uh, in this case, maybe just send an email to our support team. So support at the GCS, and then we can take a look at the route uh, that we're using. And we just need to like, collect a bit more information. So this is not enough for me to answer it now. But yeah, I'll also like, write to you uh to yeah basically send us an email to our support team and uh, uh christophs i saw uh, some message which will be very uh, good for eduard and this is the idea of our webinar as well to share experience and to provide the context of our clients and i saw that uh, the guy from panama uh, uh he just said that he has the same project in uh, in his country and he's going to 
to contact Eduarda. It's a very good issue that Eduarda, I think it's uh, uh, it's uh, very good for you as well to contact this guy and uh, you will show the here. lighter. We, huh? we, we contact you, absolutely. Yes, um, we already have his information. One of the guys from my team, Mike, he's on the attendees, so I believe they, they spoke. Yeah, yeah, super, super. So this is the idea of our uh, meeting as well. So let's share our experience and let's share contacts and maybe you will find a good solution for you. Um, uh, and finally, uh, so right now, uh, the system calibrates the LiDAR. Uh, we have a different, uh, um, uh, the different uh, quality of calibration. And if we have a high uh, quality of calibration, it, it has very uh, high precision measurement and made me high precision measurement. And like now, right now, all LiDAR point clouds will be created automatically for all flights together. So, and this is why, Eduardo, we process your data sets together within a few days. Just uh, you, you provided free data sets uh, with free base station and within one day it was totally uh, finished. And in the second day we process the second data set and so on. So because all data sets are processed very automatically. And do you remember when we uh, made the training, how difficult it was to use inertial explorer how difficult to use another one software to generate point cloud. So right now, uh, uh, time comes and uh, you may explain users how it is easy to use as well. Oh yeah, I mean, the, the, in the crash course, uh, I, I was there for the lighter training. That, like I couldn't sleep, not a single day, because uh, we, would, we would go to the training and I would learn all these things. And in so many steps, and then I would have to go at night and redo them a lot. <laughs> So many times until I, the next day it would be okay. But now with this new um, workflow that Maxime uh, made for us, <laughs> um, considering we have so many flights, it just made things so much easier, you know, because before you had to take a lot of boxes and, and have a um, knowledge of many uh, things in order to get the results done. And you had to practice a lot and it took some time. And with this, uh, with this new software, these guys on, developed it really does make it a lot simpler a lot faster we don't have to we don't have to wait too so long for the computer to do uh, her part you know it's just really more agile everything uh color uh, ah very good question from our user as well uh, uh, can the Topatron sensor setting be implemented in UGCS software? I think, uh, yes, uh, we, we should talk with Christophs and uh, the guys will add our settings because we test a lot and we work a lot together. And I think it's easy, easy to do. How do you think, Christophs? Yeah, I think the, in the future, it shouldn't really be a problem to have any, yeah. any closer integration between us and Topatron LiDARs. Okay, so... So uh, the so processing is still uh, continuing. Max, you want to show no, no, something? No, no, it's everything is finished. And right now mm -hmm. we generated point cloud. And uh, uh, as soon as we uh, generate point cloud, we can edit. And finally, we can check the accuracy, but you will get totally the same result. So I just add two point clouds, which was generated. And we can check the strip alignment between uh, lines. And it was totally automatically generated. And after that, we can check the accuracy of trip alignment between uh, several flights as well. And we can see that I, they are totally overlapping and there is no any displacement, what we can see on the screen. So it's amazing quality of the point cloud because Eduardo tried to fly in very low altitude and uh, he, he got very accurate point cloud and very detailed with, that, uh, with very low level of noise. You can see it, uh, how clear the structure of the trees. And finally, uh, when we compare alignment between flight uh, 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 between different flights, we can find that there is no any misplacement, and all data processing is made totally automatically. This is our idea, just to make one button solution. But every time you can change the settings, every time it's not a closed box. There are a lot of settings inside inside of the software which allows you to uh, to uh, to set up everything properly. So, uh... Uh, we have one, also one question about uh, is the Topodron strip alignment as accurate as LIDAR 360? Maybe you can comment on this. 
Yeah, it's totally the same. Uh, if we if you compare uh, if you compare angles of uh, angles uh, which will be calibrated, it will be totally the same. And right now you don't. Of course, you can run lidar three hundred sixty, and of course you uh, you, you can improve the data and you can. Uh, uh, evaluate the data, classify the data in lighter 360, but all data sets will be prepared for you automatically. Even all data sets will be uh, cut to the different strip lines. It's very important issue that you don't need to spend a lot of time and it will, everything will be uh, published uh, in the, uh, all these improvements will be released in the new version of our software this week. And okay, so I think uh, now maybe I'll just quickly switch on over to what I want to show to you on our website. So I'll just uh, take over the screen sharing for a bit if you're done, Max, with uh, what you want to yeah, show. Yeah, yeah, I need to switch off mm -hmm. uh, sharing. Ah, it's switched off, yes. Uh, now it's still sharing, but in just a moment, uh, you ah, should stop be able... sharing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. I need to click stop sharing. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so now you should be able to see my screen. So I just wanted to uh, come towards the end of the webinar, maybe just show you where you can go to learn more and where you can actually get the software as well. So if you go firstly in our site to gcs.com, you can of course read about all the features about the LiDAR tool set as well. And then if you click here on pricing, you will be taken to our shop where firstly, you see, this is the EGCS expert license, which you uh, can use for planning the LiDAR surveys. This is what I was showing here. And then in addition to that, if you go up here to GCS and then LiDAR solutions, here you can find firstly, top of drone LiDARs, as well as uh, LiDAR 360 software uh, that was also shown here, as well as top of drone LiDAR post-processing software. So basically all of these you can get from our site. You can also go to Topadron's site and get them there. So this would be topadron.com. So you can basically go to GCS, the Topadron. You can read uh, more about everything and yeah, then make your decision on uh, what sensors, what software are you interested in. And of course, we'll, we'll always hear. So you can don't hesitate to reach out to us. Uh, and uh, yep, after the webinar as well, we will send you the recording of this. So if you want to maybe replay some parts, you will be able to do that. So yeah, towards the end, just want to thank everybody for listening. I think it was quite interesting and the Q&A section was also uh, very, very interesting for me as well. And yeah, hope to see you in the future webinars. And if maybe you have some Spanish speaking friends who want to join uh, and see this again, then tomorrow we'll be doing the same webinar, but in Spanish language. So you can also uh, ask them to join if they want to. So yeah, thank you everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Nice Nos vemos mañana. Nos vemos mañana. <laughs>